On 12 News at 4, we are all about bringing you solutions and empowering you to better your lives. Every day, we bring some of the Valley's most experienced professionals to discuss trending topics on health, ways to save money and improve your financial life, the law, relationships, we even have an expert on pets. And it's not just us asking the questions, we give you, the viewer, the opportunity to weigh in and ask questions too. Now, we're putting all these segments together in one place for you. This is Ask the Expert. Kate, the Princess of Wales announced today that she was diagnosed with cancer and is undergoing chemotherapy, breaking her silence in a rare video message after weeks of widespread speculation over her health as people in the UK rally around her. Told News journalist Mark Curtis is live in the newsroom for us with what's next for the royal family. Mark? Rachel, it's been a rough couple of years for the royal family. Princess Kate said today that she's in the early stages of preventative, ke preventative chemotherapy. Now this comes after the princess underwent surgery in January for what doctors believed was a non-malignant abdominal condition. Further testing after the operation revealed the presence of an unspecified form of cancer. She said the news came as a complete shock and that she and Prince William needed time to process it for the sake of their young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be OK. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal. The princess praised Prince William for being by her side as a great source of comfort and reassurance and thanked the public for their support. The news, obviously, just devastating for the British monarchy. Back in February, Buckingham Palace announced that King Charles is also undergoing cancer treatment. Rachel? Yeah, tough news for the royal family. Mark, thank you for those details. And joining us now live in studio to talk about this is Dr. Natasha Bouillon with One Medical Group. So obviously, Kate Middleton did not reveal the type of cancer that she had and that she's diagnosed with, but this is a scary reality because projections so she's not going to be alone in 2020. Yeah, you know, this is really unfortunate, but the American Cancer Society said that we are going to see a record number of cancer diagnoses in 2024. And I think what's even more alarming is we are seeing more and more cancer in young people under the age of 50, just like Kate, who's only 42. Certainly. And we don't know what she has. We know it might be an abdominal or a pelvic cancer, and we're seeing more colon cancer, cervical cancers. And so what I encourage my patients is don't ignore any signs if you have any new symptoms. So, yeah. Right, because we say early detection is so important. So what are the signs and symptoms people can be looking for? Yeah, they can often be vague. So it might be that people are feeling full early. They might have changes in bowel movements. They might have some gas or bloating, even minor weight loss. And all of these signs, they're easy to just write off and they're easy to say nothing's going on. But I tell people, even if you have something minor, like nausea, something new for you, check in with your doctor because it might be nothing, but it could be something more serious like cancer. Certainly, and no one knows your body and the way you operate more than you do. So, you know, take that jump if you do see something different. Um, we know it's Colon Cancer Awareness Month as well. So, um, you had mentioned that beauty influencer Jessica Petaway died this week age 36 and it was from cervical cancer. So again, what can women especially be doing and asking their gynecologist when they're going in for those annual exams? And, and that was just so devastating because nobody in this country should die of cervical cancer. There are ways to prevent it. There are ways to treat it. I tell everyone, make sure you are going in for your annual exam. Make sure for women you are getting your pap smear, um, making sure we're think, doing things like getting our breast cancer screenings as well. And then the HPV vaccine, this is so key. It could actually help prevent cancers. And there's studies that show people who've gotten the HPV vaccine, there are rates of no cancers in them. So I think the number one thing is go in, see your doctor, make sure you stay on top of your screening. And the colon cancer age for screening is now age 45. Used to be age 50, but we are telling people if you're age 45, check in with your doctor. Okay.
everyone. It was four years ago this month during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic that kids nationwide began going to school online to learn. The thought was that it would keep students safe without decreasing the quality of education, but the numbers we see now show that's not exactly how it worked out. A study led by researchers at Harvard and Stanford found school districts that spent most of the 2020-2021 school year remote saw students fall more than half a grade behind in math and national test scores from spring 2023 show that students third through eighth grade overall have not quite rebounded from what they lost in math mathematics. Experts say districts need to boost funding for tutoring and summer school to get some of those numbers back up. Now to our 12 News Verify. Today we are asking the expert about several viral videos circulating online that claim to improve the way we look and feel. So Dr. Natasha Bouillon with One Medical Group is back to weigh in on three specific clips. So welcome back, Doc. We want to start with the first one regarding red light therapy and its alleged benefits. So let's take a look at the clip. Did you know if you use red light therapy, it can produce new collagen, alleviate depression, rejuvenate skin, help with chronic pain, and much, much more. Okay, that's a lot of benefits for a red light therapy. It mask. seems like a miracle cure-all. That's partly true. So okay. we've known for years that red light therapy is great for wound healing. Sure. And the reason why is red light can actually help activate mitochondria in our cells. What we're learning now is red light is actually helpful for skin benefits. So it can help the collagen in our cells. Okay. And so that can help reduce fine lines, wrinkles, even people who have redness from acne, inflammation from acne, doing a red light mask is beneficial. Now here's the catch. Yes. Not all red light masks are created the same. Okay. And they can range from hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars. Right. So you wanna buy the right one with the right wavelength and the right intensity. And then the other catch is, while it helps skin, it doesn't have many other benefits. And so the research shows it doesn't help improve your mood. It doesn't help with back pain. And so it'll make your skin glow and look great, but doesn't have other benefits. Okay, so read the fine print before purchasing. Okay, we've got another one here. This is another mix-in. It seems like a lot of these superfood powders are making waves and growing in popularity, but bovine colostrum. We're gonna watch the clip and then ask about the benefits here, listen. So I hopped on the colostrum train just like everybody else on the internet right now. And I went with the Wonder Cow brand basically because it is like family owned and operated, which I highly respect. I also read that it was like the highest concentration you can buy um, compared to that other brand that was like going viral. If you don't know what colostrum is, basically it's nature's superfood. It's good for like your gut health, immune support, restorative sleep, hair, skin, nails, um, mood, energy. I mean, it's, it's, it does it all. These seem like cure-alls. It seems like a miracle milk, yes. right? And you know, here's the thing, colostrum is actually really beneficial to humans. Okay. So colostrum is the milk that's made early on after um, mom has a baby. And in cows, it's for calves. And so colostrum is really beneficial because it's really rich in antibodies. But here's the catch. We are using antibodies for humans, not necessarily for cows. Right. And so the there's research, a distinction. There's there. a distinction there. <laughs> and so the research that we've done from bovine colostrum, we find that it can help gut health. Okay. So if people are having indigestion, it can help with indigestion, it can help with loose stools, but really that's where the benefits end. You know, I have patients asking me all the time, can it help with athletic performance or my hair or my skin? And really there's no evidence that bovine colostrum helps with any of that, really just gut health. Okay. So Stay with us here. So far, we can verify that red light therapy works to make your skin glow and that bovine colostrum helps with gut health. But lastly, we do want to take a look at this clip that's catching attention. Listen to this one. Let's talk about why you should be taping your mouth shut every single night before you go to bed. Breathing through your mouth contributes to a host of issues, including bad breath, gum disease, cavities, brain fog, and a weakened immune system. There are so many more, and most people, myself included, breathe through their mouths at night. Taping your mouth shut before bed completely prevents that. I'm not kidding. You will have the best sleep of your entire life. I can no longer sleep without it, but I do have to remind you, please get actual mouth tape. Don't just put regular tape on your mouth, but it is so easy. It doesn't come off overnight, and you're going to have the best sleep ever. Follow for more. Okay, so hard pass on the duct tape as an option, no. but maybe not even at all. You know, here's the thing. Mouth breathing is actually our backup breathing at night. <laughs> And so this trend is actually dangerous Please. because if we're not able to breathe through our no nose because you have sleep apnea or nasal polyps, you or need allergies. to- allergies. Yeah, exactly, or congestion. Sure. You need to be able to breathe through your mouth. And so that's a backup. Now here's the thing, 
Breathing through your nose is better because you humidify the air, you can filter allergens, but there are other ways to train yourself to breathe through your nose when you're sleeping, like sleeping on your side or daytime meditation practices, but mouth taping is not the way to train yourself to breathe through your nose. Okay, so last but not least, we can verify, no, mouth tape is not going to necessarily give you the best sleep of your life. No, okay. skip that one. Dr. It is now time to continue asking the expert. We've been giving you a lot to work with today. Dr. Natasha Bouillon still here with us from One Medical Group. Our first question is from Olivia in Glendale. What are the true benefits of CMOS? Now, I had never heard of it, so you let it rip. You know, it's interesting. My patients ask me about CMOS all the time. I see ads for it all over Instagram. CMOS is really like a sea vegetable. So okay. it is packed with nutrients, iron, and fiber. And there's research that shows if people take CMOS and they've got joint swelling or joint stiffness, it can help improve that. The other thing is because it's packed with fiber, it helps people feel full sooner. Oh. And so it can help with weight loss. Now here's the thing. The downside is CMOS is really expensive. Oh, and so sure. I tell my patients, just stick with land vegetables. You know, if you eat broccoli and kale, those are also packed with fiber and nutrients and it'll get you the same benefits. And a little less expensive. Less expensive. Okay, we always like that as an option. Okay, Brianna from North Phoenix. What type of collagen is the best? I've heard of so many different brands. I know I've heard marine collagen and then the basics. All, all kinds of collagen, yeah, and it's good for our skin. So here's the thing. Because it's a supplement, it's not regulated by the FDA. And so it's really hard to recommend a brand because we don't actually know what exactly is in all of these supplements. So what I tell people is read the label. Type one collagen is the best because that is what's for hair and skin okay. and nails and bones. usually what people are after is yeah, those is the type one collagen. Typical things. Okay. I always say look for animals that are grass fed, non-GMO, no other additives or sugars or any art anything artificial. Okay. And so if you read the label, you can find the one that's right for you, but it's it's really hard to recommend a, a brand based on FDA regulations. Sure, and there's so many now. We talked about the superfood mix-ins exactly. and all of that. Yeah. Okay, so Jade from Anthem says, if interested in the red light therapy, which we talked about earlier, how much time exposed is too much You time? know, that is a great question. So it's important to remember, red light therapy is very different than things like UV radiation, okay. and so it doesn't come with the same harms. Now, the best red light masks, they're the ones that are effective if you just wear it for five to 10 minutes. And so a lot of doctors say, we don't want you going beyond 30 minutes. More is not better. But if you can get the benefit in five to 10 minutes, that's ideal. And here's the problem. We don't actually know what happens if you do longer than 30 minutes a day. We don't know what the risks are for the upper ends of normal. Sure. And so we always say 30 minutes max. And I'm sure those videos are out there too, probably horrifying. People doing hours. Too much. And yeah. you don't probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, you don't want to overcorrect. If you're feeling like you have a problem with one of these areas, skin, hair, nails, yeah. you don't want to overcorrect. Exactly, yeah. So if you use more red light, it's not like you're going to get a better benefit. It's really use it as directed. Okay. All right, as directed, Destiny from Phoenix asking, I have been in love with matcha lately. I love matcha too. I put the organic powder in with a cup of ice, oat milk, and agave. What are the health benefits of this particular tea? I love matcha as well. So for people who don't know, this is a Japanese tea. It's a green tea. Like it does have health benefits. It's packed with antioxidants. Okay. And so we love that because it can help decrease inflammation. Now for matcha in particular, there was a study that found people who drink matcha tea, they have less stress. Ooh. And so it's helpful for stress and anxiety. There was another study that found people who drank it, they were able to perform better on tasks because it helped with attention. But the catch there is, it might be because of the caffeine. So the caffeine might be helping with attention, but we do think it has stress relieving benefits to it. So I love matcha. And probably beneficial if you're not a coffee drinker, which I know a lot of people yeah. surprisingly in this uh, newsroom don't drink coffee. Yeah. So if you can get a little bit of that caffeine from the matcha tea. Exactly, yeah, and nice. I don't drink coffee either. And so, you know, I think tea is kind of the way I go if I want to get caffeine. And so okay. it does have that nice benefit of helping you relax because a lot of drinks with caffeine actually make you more stressed. Sure. They amp you up. And so this is one of those few drinks that has caffeine that can actually relax you a little bit. Wow, a nice middle of the road. Okay, yes. Dr. Yeah. Natasha Bouillon, thank you so much. And this Money Saving Monday, we are talking about skincare. The skincare industry is one of the fastest growing beauty markets in the U.S. Globally, the market was valued at $147 billion in 2021. And by the year 2031, it's expected to reach $273 billion, according to Allied Market Research. And when it comes to the most common skincare products that are used among women around the world. The latest numbers from Drive Research shows moisturizers came in at the top, 
followed by cleansers and sunscreens. But ladies, you know it's not cheap. So which products are worth splurging on and which should you save on? Let's ask the expert. Joining me now is Dr. James Pahoshek with All Dermatology. Okay, first off, because yes. it is Money Saving Monday, let's exactly. save people money and let's talk about some mm -hmm. of the products to save on, starting with sunscreen. Sunscreen. So my take on sunscreen is you want to buy a sunscreen that you're going to use. Number one, it's dumb having bottles and cans of sunscreen yes. laying around that you don't use. And the things you're looking for are broad spectrum. Mm -hmm. You want an SPF. I like at least a 50. Yeah, especially um, out those here. Those aren't hard to get. I mm -hmm. mean, this one's a 50. Um, this one here I got is a 70. Okay. We got even up to 100. Wow. Um, but the nice thing is you don't have to spend a lot of money. Okay. Like I personally, I use the products I like to use, but I look for the bargains, like going to Costco. Mm -hmm. Costco sometimes will have two pack for oh, yeah. less than one can at some of the other stores. Yep. Um, the other thing, I like just the bargain, like the, the no name brands like Target. Oh, and, and they work just as good? Yeah, and they have great products and they've okay. been shown time and time again. They have the right ingredients in them. Good. Uh, you're looking for things like avobenzone, oxybenzone. If you don't like chemical sunscreens, there's uh, the ones that have zinc and titanium dioxide yeah. in them. They're micronized and you don't have to spend a ton. Now, if you want to get a little bit fancier, some of these like the La Roche-Posay one I like because it's light, you can uh -huh. shake a shake of one, you can hear the little thing inside. Okay. But it's nice and it, again, if you find one you really like, like this is the one I splurge on a little bit for the face because it just feels better. Right, right. I've actually used that. Yeah, it's yeah. very thin and yeah, it's, um, it's thin, not oily. It's light. And I love the sprays for all over. Yes. And they don't have to be expensive. Okay, good. Moisturizers. Really? Moisturizers They're, don't have to be that expensive? No. One of my personal favorites, the one I use every day, is the CeraVe cream. It's okay. nice. Uh, it's one of those ones. I go to Costco to get it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, Honest to God, I swear I buy all my own suns uh, sunscreen and moisturizers these days. So going to like, again, Costco has great deals on stuff like this. They also have the CeraVe products, CeraVe yeah. and Cetaphil. Yeah. Cetaphil moisturizer is nice. I try to find people that, you know, I tell people, look, try one, try the other, mm -hmm. see which one you like the best. The other thing too is if you go to like, our office, our, our dermatology practice, we get lots of little samples of these things. So okay. ask your doctor when you go, do you have any samples oh, of these samples. things that I can try? Yes. So before you go out and buy like a giant bottle of something like this, the Excellent. Cetaphil cleanser, yeah. you'll, you can try it before you buy it. Okay, this surprised me. You say acne products. Really, you don't have to spend no. a fortune on that? Acne products, again, um, I think going, either getting them as a prescription, like if you want a retin retinoid, you can get that from your dermatologist. And a lot okay. of times if you're a teenager or under 25, your insurance will cover it. Okay. Um, and then buying, not buying the fanciest brand. You don't have to spend a fortune on these things. You can get some really decent priced products because the key thing is looking at the active ingredients. And again, looking at the counter, I always look, I, I, do, I shop for all these things too, so okay. I can see what my patients are paying. All so. right, speaking of spending a fortune, now, now we have to unfortunately kind of spend a fortune. Let's go over products worth splurging on, yes. starting with serums. So serums, uh, there's a lot of different products out there. My thing is don't necessarily buy something that's the flash of the day. Okay. Like we went through green tea extracts and there was mm -hmm. coconut oil, there was yeah, activated so trocol. And they sell like crazy and they're all over the internet and TikTok. And then they're gone. Right. And you might have a cabinet full of those that you never use. So I say stick to the tried and true things. So the retinols, the retinoids, retinoids you have to get as a prescription. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, the uh, nicotinamide. Okay. That's something that's been helpful. All these work is antioxidants, anti-aging, and they help with dry skin, brittle skin, and they make your skin look more refreshed and plump your skin. Yes, it's all about getting rid of those wrinkles. All right. All right. It's time now to ask the expert here to answer your questions live on air about skin care is dermatologist Dr. James Pahoshek with All Dermatology. Okay, we got lots of questions. So first up, Janie in Phoenix says, Korean skin care is having a moment on social media. Is it safe to use? If so, is there a way to know you're buying the real thing versus a fake product? I see Korean skin yes, care Korean blowing Korean skin care is huge. Yes. Tons of products coming out of there. We actually do some drug studies and they're just coming out like crazy. So again, there's a lot of stuff that's coming down the pipeline from yeah. those pla from other places. Yeah. Got to be careful of what it is. Some of it's great, some of it's not. Not some of it's not FDA approved. So okay. you got to be careful when you buy products. How do you know though? Eh, don't be the first one in line. Okay. <laughs>
right? That's kind of my thing. Give yeah. it some time and then see what happens before you start spending a lot of money on product line that maybe is going to burn your skin or leave you with some problems. So right. again, don't fall victim to the TikToks. Yeah, maybe go yeah. with the tried and true yeah, exactly. as that you were saying before. This viewer says, my wife has gone through chemo treatments. Mm. Is there a specific way or a specific treatment for skin care? Yeah, and that's a real problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we have patients that come in with that periodically. Um, aloe, pure aloe can help. Okay. Uh, Aquaphor, Vaseline, just simple things. Uh, and then your doctor can get you a prescription for sylvadine cream, which is also very inexpensive. It's prescription, uh -huh. but it can work and it can help a lot. Yeah, so, for yeah. that ultra hydrating, that's what you're yeah. looking at? Yeah, you really, you want to protect the skin, you want to kind of lock in the moisture and okay. give it a chance to heal because radiation is very tough on the skin. Yeah, I bet. Okay, Jessica in Tempe says, what is the correct order to use products? For example, do I cleanse, tone, moisturize, and then use serums? Yeah, it's I like get that. Like a multi-step process. Exactly, yeah. I get that question a lot. Yeah. And as a guy, I, know, I wash my face, put on a little moisturizer. <laughs> But, okay, think okay. like a woman. So yeah. I sort of think of it, yes, exactly. I sort of look at it as uh, use the stuff that's probably got the biggest bang on the, on the base coat. So okay. if you're using a retinoid, I have that put on first because okay. that's the stuff that you want to get into the skin and penetrate well. So then put on your moisturizer after that if you have a serum. You know, again, some of it's mix and match, but right. you, gotta, you gotta be careful and, and you don't want to, you don't want and you don't want to mix two things together that might in inactivate the other one. So yes. that's a problem too. Okay. Um, I've always heard lightest to heaviest too. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, All I, right. I just say put the most important one on first. Okay. Like people got come it. in with their acne or their skincare, and I'm like, look, use the one that I really want to do the job. For. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The most potent. All yeah. right. Kay from Glendale says, I'm a black woman in my early 60s. I've had hyperpigmentation for 15 years, mostly due to ingrown facial hairs and acne. I haven't been able to stop plucking the hairs daily with tweezers. I've struggled with finding laser options that work for black women. Please help. Huge problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I always go to lectures about this. There's a lot of in the literature. It's a difficult situation. People with darker skin tones, black people, uh, Hispanics, uh, Asians. Problem is, treat some of these things with a laser or a chemical peel, and what you get is a backfire on you. It <gasps> makes it darker. And I've had that happen Ooh. in a couple of patients that I wasn't expecting it. It's terrible. So the general rule is start very simple. Don't let somebody talk you into something that's a laser because it sounds good because it might just destroy oh your skin gosh. and make things worse. So go to somebody who's going to take baby steps at first. Work yourself into stuff. Gently work your way in. Like chemical peels, we do test spots. Same with lasers. Do a test spot or something first. But yeah. start with topicals first and see how those go. And then if you don't have results with that, your doctor can get you where you need to be. Oh, good advice. But All it's right. Tricky. Yeah, I bet. That's frightening. Okay, this viewer says, how do you remove a cyst from your face? Ooh. If you're doing it at home, you have a small superficial little cyst, you can get a thing called a comedone extractor. Okay, yeah. That sometimes you can buy those in the drugstore. Usually I tell people to get their face warm and moist before you do it, like right after the shower. If it's something that's deeper, Go in and see your doctor yeah. because if the thing we see all the time is people who try to pop a cyst and it pops on the inside, then you end up with an abscess. And if it's on your face, you end up with a giant boil on your face. Oh, no. And then you just wish you had your cyst. So yeah. be careful. Okay. Don't overdo it. Yeah, just to be safe, go see the dermatologist. Yeah, go all see right. the dermatologist. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, James. We appreciate it. Well, in today's pet health, we've got grains on the brain. The pet food industry is full of choices for your dog. And for years, pet owners were told grain-free dog food was better than food with grains. And that's caused those food products to explode in popularity. In fact, the options for grain-free pet food represents more than 40% of dry dog foods in the U.S., according to the National Institutes of Health. But more recently, we've been told grain-free pet food can be harmful to our dogs. So let's clear up all the confusion and ask the expert, Brett the Vet, with Arizona Animal Hospital. All right, let's start from the beginning. Explain what exactly does grain-free dog food mean? Grain and grain-free. Grain would include corn, wheat, soy. Mm -hmm. Grain-free would be something like sweet potatoes. Okay, so in light of that, the bottom line is 
can it be harmful to our pets? It's really funny because we've kind of come full circle over yeah. the last two decades. If you ask me, it's all marketing. Okay. So 20 years ago, grain free became a, frankly a marketing strategy to compete against the big, big guys. Mm -hmm. uh, to, so these smaller pet food companies, which are good companies, could grow market share. Okay. And that's, we've all kind of looked at grain free and perceived it as healthy, but frankly, uh, if you ask a lot of experts, corn has got the same nutritional value as a sweet potato. Mm -hmm. So it really is kind of coming back full circle now to the you know grains versus grain free, as you said. So. so then what exactly should we be looking for when it comes to pet food? Well, the other thing about grain free, remember we had that big debacle in 2018, mm -hmm. before I answer that question, yeah. where we saw these dogs with heart disease. Oh. So kind of the big situation, the situation there was the grain free product was substituting plant based protein for with me they were substituting meat with plant based protein oh meat dogs and cats we know are true obligate carnivores if you don't have enough meat in your diet mm -hmm. they will develop heart disease dogs and cats oh. so some of these grain free diets dogs were doing just that developing heart disease so we've since recognized that we need to improve those formulas, those grain-free formulas, right. by adding more meat or substituting with taurine. So, um, so grain-free's gotten a little heat recently. So should we just avoid it then? No, I think since this, they learned their lessons, I think a lot of people have adjusted their formulas to okay. ensure that dilated cardiomyopathy, the disease that we see in dogs and cats who don't get enough meat, Mm -hmm. is largely eliminated with these with these dog food brands. Okay, so it's now, I mean, we can feel safe then if we chose to buy the grain-free. I would say food. so, but there are some breeds, y'all out there know them, golden retrievers, et cetera, that might want to just avoid it until the verdict is official. But to me, okay. the problem has largely been solved by adding more meat and more taurine to those diets. Okay, so let's just play it safe and go with just the regular typical grain you I think. think so. Okay, all right. Let's talk about the other choices because there are so many. We're talking fresh food, there's frozen, there's raw, kibble, cooked, cans, all of the above. You know, how do we know what's best for our dog? How do we choose? Yeah. You know, it boils down to what, what the dog likes, in okay. my opinion. A lot of times dogs will turn up their nose to certain foods or it doesn't agree with their tummy. Right. So you want to find something that works with them that they mm -hmm. like. Raw food is a popular trend. I don't recommend raw food around families with right. children. Because of the salmonella. Yeah, foodborne, yeah. listeria, the yeah. things we see in the news, foodborne illnesses can be, are, are not that common, but they do exist. And when they do, they're devastating. So I personally like to feed Josie kibble because it's convenient. Okay. We have a busy household. Right. I find a good quality kibble that I can trust. Mm -hmm. And she's done really well with that. But ultimately, it's really what you, the consumer, feel good about. With the, but I would say it is all marketing, 75% marketing, 25% quality of ingredients. So okay. find something that works for your budget, that your dog likes, and uh, that you, you feel good about. All right. Well, it's time now to ask the expert here to answer your questions live on air is Brett the Vet from Arizona Animal Hospital. Okay, first up, Thomas in Litchfield Park says, our French Bulldog's name is... Bapu. I hope I said that right. I'm sorry, Thomas. He gets red, itchy, and swollen on his paws and under his belly. We were told to change his food, so we did, but we're not noticing a difference. Ooh, what does he do? What a oh, handsome boy. So cute. Yeah. So stout. Well, this question, as you see, is coming up again and again and yes. again. You know, allergy season, dog food. So allergies in Arizona, the spring tide's coming. It's all pollens and molds that we're all reacting to. Yeah. So Bapu's dog food is sometimes very low, low on the list. So it's not apt to change his skin condition and his itchiness. So right. usually it's the environment. So Bapu, we've got all those medications we've talked about on the show before mm -hmm. uh, for itch um, that we can get at our veterinary hospital or sometimes there's over-the-counter medications that we can use yeah. that can help reduce that itch. But I don't know that the food's going to make a big difference this time. Okay. It's I, probably in the environment. You know what? I'm going to do a follow-up question. Yeah. What are your thoughts on, I know you said food is low on the totem pole, but what are your thoughts on like 
you know, salmon or fish in the dog food versus, you know, some kind of a meat. Just because I'm thinking fish with the omega, it helps with skin. I mean, yeah. does that, you think that makes a difference? A lot of those foods are already fortified with those fish oils, those omega fatty acids. Okay. That being said, if you're feeding a chicken-based dog food, which is one of the most common, right. and you do want to try something, okay. go to what's called a limited ingredient diet, meaning one protein and one grain source or grain-free source, uh -huh. as we spoke about. So changing from f chicken to fish okay. and potato, or yeah. chicken and rice to beef and potato, oh, and I doing see. a food trial for two right. months to see if, ba if it helps Bapu. Okay, okay, I hope that helped, Thomas. Nicole from Scottsdale says, this is Duke. Duke, love it. Recently, he has begun to start rubbing and itching his ears as well as shaking his head. Could this be allergy related and how can I help him feel better? I feel like this is another allergy question. Uh, it's so it huge is. right now. It's so huge. Yeah. It's like I big feel the news. Pain. Yes. Mm -hmm. So so poor Duke and poor Nicole because he looks like a big dog. I know. <laughs> so the bigger the dog, sometimes the medication requirements increase, and it can increase your cost a little bit. So how do we reduce costs um, is one question or one answer I try and help my clients with, mm. you know, save money, right. especially with allergies being more of a chronic problem, needing constant treatment. Yes. Now, yes. So the answer is yes, this is allergies, okay. and he's going to need some support probably have to probably recommend Nicole you go see the vet because what happens here and we see this too often is if we ignore those allergies too long and he's rubbing his face we can get into things like skin infections eye infections eye ulcers Ooh. and it can just take more work to unravel those problems so so try to get him in I, earlier I think this one he should be seen Nicole yeah, okay. All right, Susie from Glendale says, I have a very picky dog. The only kibble she will eat is something with fish in it. Is that enough for her to stay healthy or does she need a variety? This oh, princess, cutie. is that a bow in that princess's it hair? It almost looks like it. Yeah, yes. or is that like, yeah. <laughs> so Susie, I think you're spoiling her. <laughs> I think so. So, so, but yes, the fish is a good diet. If you do, an, if you do a store-bought or, or a pet store-bought, diet, those are complete nutritionally balanced. All the extra ingredients in there, the vitamins, the minerals, mm -hmm. the fish oils, uh, the grains and the protein source is adequate. I don't mind, my dog Josie eats healthy treats, things that I eat like apples, strawberries, bananas, even some meats. If it's good for me, it's good for my dog as long as she tolerates it. Oh. So, but I would say Susie's eating a pretty good diet and she might be running the household if she won't she looks eat her like diet. It. If yeah. she's kind of picky, sometimes you can just hold out, and if she doesn't eat breakfast, pick it up, put it down at dinner. She'll probably get hungry to where she will if you're trying to break that habit. Right, right. Otherwise, just spoil her for life. I was going to say, she is the queen of the household. She sure is. Yes. John from Desert Ridge. Oh, my gosh. You know how much I love Goldens. My Golden Retriever loves enzymatic chews, which are good for teeth and reduce plaque. The only problem is when they get moist from saliva, they get stuck in his throat. Oh no. Any recommendations for healthy chews? Ooh, I'm Great listening. question. Great question. Yeah. We did a thing on this uh, last month where we showed a variety of chew treats. So John, if this is an exuberant, an exuberant chewer and is swallowing those large chunks, they can get stuck. So my solution for my dog, Josie, who's very similar, is I get her the big rawhides. They work for my dog. And those big, long rawhides, she'll sit and chew and chew and chew and chew. And when you get down to the small end, I yes. throw it away. Oh. So she doesn't try swallowing the big chunks. That right. works for my dog. Okay. Now the enzymatic chews are great because the, ingre the enzymes itself help break the tartar, or just break, take care of the tartar yeah. in the mouth. And we see really clean mouths with that product. So John, I'd say, Keep it up under direct supervision. Okay. But if we're trying to swallow them whole, yeah. we might go get a, I think those enzyme chews are rawhides as well, but maybe okay. find a bigger rawhide and then watch under direct supervision. Okay, I'm gonna try that too. Take Thanks, it away. John. If, uh, yeah, take it away yeah. if it's a problem. Well, on this Wellness Wednesday, we're also talking about betrayal trauma and how to cope. Betrayal trauma is what you experience after you've put your ultimate trust in someone close to you and that someone has broken that trust and violated you. This could be in the form of child abuse, parental abandonment, domestic violence, and most often, infidelity. And last week, when we talked about the crippling effects, this topic really resonated with a lot of viewers. We received text messages and feedback 
even among our co-workers. So we wanted to continue the conversation today. Joining me once again is therapist Juliana Lidden. You know, last week when we touched about this topic, you know, we talked about minimizing the pain mm -hmm. and you talked about hypnotherapy. You are actually a clinical hypnotherapist as well. So walk us through how this works. Yes, so the really amazing thing about hypnotherapy is it works in the subconscious. The subconscious controls 90% of our brain. Wow. It actually holds, it's like a big data bank. It holds every experience we've ever gone through in our lives. Mm -hmm. So when you come in for hypnotherapy, maybe you're suffering from betrayal trauma, okay. or maybe it's something less severe, like you're just stuck in your life. Mm -hmm. I put you into a deep state of relaxation. Now, when I do that, what happens is the subconscious mind kind of wakes up oh. and it is very open to suggestibility. So we go back when we're suffering trauma or a pain point, we can go back through the continuum of our lives and we can find where we have seen or experienced a similar trauma. Mm. So sometimes it can be even in childhood. Yeah. And so through this relaxed state, the really amazing thing is we find that memory, we bring it up, we heal some of this inner child. But here's the piece that's amazing. We can actually change the belief that you had about yourself. So as a young child, maybe what happened is I felt unloved. Aww. I felt so disempowered. I was so unhappy. And in that moment, we can shift that to I'm happy. I'm powerful. I'm grateful. And when you come out of that deep, relaxed state, my goodness, you feel so much more whole because you've healed. Yes. Oh my gosh, I got chills yes. when you were explaining that to me. And I, I bet you feel awakened. Oh my gosh, It's like a rebirth. Do. It is. Yeah. It is. It's yeah. just beautiful. It really is. Wow. Okay. And is it one session or is it multiple? It's I mean, a does this great take, subject. Yeah, I'm great just topic. curious. And it probably depends on the type of trauma it too, does. right? So you have to work on one thing at a time. So okay. you come in, maybe it's betrayal trauma, infidelity. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go back and look where you experienced a similar type of trauma. Mm. Maybe is isn't infidelity, right. but trauma stays with us yeah. unless we deal with it. And it just kind of lays low till you hit right. something again and bam, you might yeah. really explode with yeah. a lot of pain. To and you, and wait till you like bring it to the surface yeah, yeah to yeah. expose it right okay what if some people would be scared to go through this, to go under, yes. you know, hypnotherapy. Yes. Well, what happens is sometimes people think, if you remember the comedy clubs and stuff, yeah. where they go around and, oh then, my God. and then you're and on the stage, crazy yeah, yeah, and yeah. you're clucking like a chicken. <laughs> so they think, oh, you're gonna, you know, if it's suggestible, right. the subconscious, maybe you're going to make me think something or do something. Yeah. Absolutely not. The okay. beautiful thing is, you will do nothing or think anything that you don't feel comfortable with. Oh, wow. So the people on that stage, yeah. they go around, they've already talk to everybody and they know they can't wait to be excited and show off. Yeah, I yeah it's kind of planted. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. So they know. Uh, okay, so you talked about hypnotherapy. There are other two other mm -hmm. uh, modalities. Can yes. you quickly go into Yes, those? EMDR and blind uh, brain spotting. Okay. Sorry, brain spotting. And what these have to do with are eye movements or mm -hmm. fields of, of the eyes mm -hmm. because what they say happens here is as your eyes are moving and you're working on the trauma, you're almost resetting it in the brain. Okay. I don't do these modalities, but they do help. Okay. And there are lots of um, therapists that do. Yeah. And then the brain spotting, is that? The same thing. So that one, you're actually looking at a specific field, um, like over in a spot, okay. which sounds so bizarre, yeah. but it works very, very well as you're moving through the traumatic experience. Oh, wow. So your eyes aren't moving, but they're fixed. Yeah. yeah. So it has to do with the eyes and the brain. It's quite it's fascinating. So fascinating. It's time now to ask the expert here to answer your questions live on air is therapist Juliana Lidden. All right, our first question is from Kelly in Phoenix. Can hypnosis cure anxiety? Oh, yes, it can. Oh. I work a lot with that. And again, we're looking, when we get into that deep, relaxed state mm -hmm. and we're working with the subconscious mind, we can really calm and make a lot of headway because we can go back and see how many times in your life you've been suffering from this. Yeah. So it's amazing when people are, are put into that space, yeah. they can really come out and feel so much better. And we know that some of the crippling effects from oh. betrayal trauma is anxiety, That's is right. PTSD, That's is right. depression. You, you so, nailed it, yeah. you nailed it. So we can, we can get it and mm -hmm. shift that, we yeah. shift it. Brian from Glendale asks, what are the disadvantages of hypnotherapy? We didn't get into that. I know, we didn't. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Some people 
are not comfortable. So they may come in, we have a discussion about now, how are you at, at getting relaxed? Because they're scared that maybe they'll do something or say something right. that, that they, they didn't want yeah, to expose. They, exactly, yeah. exactly. So okay. if, and some people that are a little bit more uptight, yeah. we have to just practice with it a little bit. Okay getting into that relaxed space. But it's just like laying down when you're, you, maybe you're gonna meditate. Yeah. Or okay. you're just doing some biofeedback. I'm gonna rest my legs, I'm gonna yeah. rest my neck, my head. Just let it go. Yeah, that's really it. You're fully aware, Yeah. fully aware. Interesting, all right. Uh, Gina from Scottsdale says this, thank you for talking about this. It helped me realize that this is me and I'm not the only one, that it's bigger than me and sometimes you need help. Oh. I'm oh my gosh. You I'm, inspired me to find someone that can help. I love that. Yes, that I is so, that. because I'm going to tell you there's so much suffering yeah. and people don't even know the name of like betrayal trauma, what it, how it even relates right. and doing this kind of modality. And yeah. it's, I love, love, love that you shared that. Thank you Gina, so much. Thank you so You're much. You're not the only one. Yeah. And this is why we do stuff like this. That's right. You know? Yeah. That's right. All right, Bryce from Mesa says, is there a difference between hypnosis and hypnotherapy? That's a good question. Yes, there is. So anyone, I shouldn't just say anyone, but a lot of people can just learn to hypnotize someone. Mm -hmm. Hypnotherapy is basically reserved for those people that are already doing some clinical work, that it's a type of therapy. So right. you, it's a credentialing, right. so right. to that, speak. That therapy so, yeah. says a lot. When yeah, it does, it does. So okay. you've obviously done other work in that field. Right. Okay. Coach, a counselor, yeah. Mm -hmm. Terry from Scottsdale says, how do you know which therapy works the best? That's true because you were talking about the yeah. other ones, brain spot, That's right. EMDR. That's right. If you have someone that you love, right? Because counseling, coaching, all that stuff is who's who's the fit. Yeah. If a lot of times they have add-ons, I, I call it, you know, where they're doing some kind of modality like that. If not, they should be well-versed in saying, hey, I can help connect you. Everybody has kind of their favorites. Okay. It just depends on really your therapist and what they have found that works yeah. well. Okay, all right, there's gotta be that connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Juliana, thank you. Oh. Juliana, thank you enough. Yes, we thank you. We love you so much and we thank so appreciate you your insight. For sharing this. And helping people like yes, you. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Today's segment on Mind and Motive, we begin with new developments in the case of Jesse Wilson. The 10-year-old boy went missing back in 2016 and was found dead in the desert two years later. Now, his biological grandmother, Cynthia Lauderdale, is in shock and disbelief after the criminal charges against Wilson's adoptive mother, Crystal Wilson, were dismissed just two days ago. Prosecutors say there wasn't enough evidence to move forward in the criminal case against Wilson. The Buckeye Police Department still not giving up, saying this is a very complicated case. The bottom line is Crystal Wilson is the only person who knows what happened to Jesse. Joining me now is psychologist Dr. Catherine Coleman, who is board certified in police and public safety psychology. Catherine, you work with law enforcement really on a daily basis. How do police feel when something like this happens? They put so much work, time and effort into an investigation like this and then only to have the case really go nowhere, especially in this case where the victims are children. Well, you're exactly right. You know, I do a lot of training with law enforcement talking about things like stress and trauma. And one of the things that we talk about as one of the biggest stressors for the job is this case is exactly like this. Yeah. You put in hours and days, I mean, years of yeah. work to submit information to the county attorney's office to prosecute a case. I mean, your blood, sweat, and tears mm -hmm. are in this. Mm -hmm. And the word that officers often use with me when describing these types of situations is they feel defeated. Oh. And it's right, and, and most, a lot of people have kids, and so yeah. they really just struggle internally with, you know, they want to do right by this kid. Right, right, because the kids are so innocent, they're so vulnerable and, you know, helpless, really. Exactly. And you know what, speaking of helpless, you know, what about in a situation like this, where you still have the surviving family members, mm -hmm. like Wilson's grandmother, and the lack of justice that they see, don't they feel like victims too? Well, absolutely. I mean, this has been going on for years, years, right? And this poor grandma has been fighting alongside with law enforcement and really wanting, you know, justice for her grandson. And it is. It's, there's a helpless feeling when you feel like you've done everything you can and you're not seeing any result. And so a lot of times what you'll see in cases like this is 
people can either go kind of one or, or two ways. Mm. Um, one is that they find meaning and purpose. So we see this with like Mothers Against Drug oh, Driving, yes. where you try to you know do something good. So right. you know you raise awareness for an issue. Right. But sometimes you'll see people try to find justice themselves, and sometimes that looks like a civil lawsuit. Um, sometimes it looks like really you know hiring private investigators or something yes. like that. So um, I hope That's whatever she does that she feels really good about it and that she feels like she's making you know right. moving forward. Right. With this. Right. And a purpose. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on to our next case now. A Glendale teacher is facing charges of voyeurism and sexual exploitation of a minor after police say his students found spy cameras in a classroom changing room at Independence High School. Now, police arrested 53-year-old Estevan Carrion three days ago after they say Carrion invited a group of students to work on a media project that happened during spring break. But while those students were changing, in a separate room, one of them noticed a hidden camera device, removed it, and hid it from the teacher. Police say that student told the other students, and they found two more cameras. Carry on has been a teacher for more than 20 years. This is so shocking. It's also so disturbing, those details. You know, I printed out the police report, and when you read it, I mean, they also found an SD card. The police report also said this. This was interesting to me. He used his power of authority as a teacher to search their pockets and their backpacks to try and locate the evidence of the crime he committed. How terrifying for these students to not only find this, but the fact that like he he physically searched them. Oh, I mean, it's it's disgusting yeah. to start with. And there's such a power differential between teachers and students that, you know, those poor students are in a place where can they really say no? Right. And that's what's going through their head. And, you know, right, it, it's a, the abuse of power. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, by the way, I'm not going to mess with this generation that really knows technology. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. And they're very, very savvy. That was another thing that caught my attention. And I thought, wow, these kids are so sharp because, you know, they could have panicked when they found those hidden cameras, but they were sneaky, they hid it, you know, and they kept it a secret from the teacher. In fact, one of them said that he needed to leave because his mom was waiting for him and he left the school with that camera. Mm -hmm. How savvy. So savvy. I mean, I think sometimes we don't recognize how smart right. you know, kids really are and how they can come together and really work through and think critically and solve yes. this problem together. I mean, really, kudos to them Yeah, because they absolutely did the right thing. I would have been scared to death. Oh you know, gosh. I think I would have panicked. I wouldn't have not known what to do, you know, and if you hit it, like, what if I got caught? I mean, there's so many factors that went into this. Well, exactly. Yeah. And I think just too, like, knowing that your fellow students had to be so violated yeah. by this teacher and like really feeling like you have to feel like you did a really good job mm -hmm. by getting that camera out of the school and notifying authorities. Right. Welcome back. Let's dive in and discuss two more local cases capturing headlines. 25 years in prison. That's the sentence Frank Lawrence III received two days ago for running over James Ackerman Jr. back in 2020 in a moment of road rage. Dr. Catherine Coleman of Coleman Psychology and Consulting joins me once again. Now, this happened in Mesa four years ago. Ackerman's girlfriend cut Lawrence off in traffic, and according to court documents, that's when Lawrence followed the couple to an apartment complex and began punching the girlfriend in the face. When Ackerman got out of the car to film Lawrence's license plate, Lawrence ran the 22-year-old over, killing him. You know what, Catherine? We see road rage all the time. It is nothing new, unfortunately. Unfortunately, but in this situation, it is so extreme. How do emotions just skyrocket like that? Well, so there's a couple of risk factors when we look at road rage. Mm -hmm. So typically we're gonna see somebody that's actually engaging in this, they're high life stressors, and that this is really displaced anger. Mm. And, it, and it kind of happens on this trajectory where they are insulting of other drivers and almost in disbelief at the way that other people drive. There's blaming you you know, oh, swerved into my yes. lane and cut me off and now I'm late for work. Or it's like you, personal. They take right, it personally. Exactly. Okay. And so then it sometimes turns into fantasies of revenge in that moment and then sometimes they act on it. And so that's what we see. And it's really scary because, you know, it, it puts so many people at risk. And right. the language that we use in our own head when we're talking about other people, yeah. when we use that word you, 
typically that's a feeling of anger, right? right? So right. name calling, insulting, yes. expletives. Yes. Blame, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting, a study by Forbes advisor last year, it actually ranked Arizona as the top state for confrontational drivers. You know, in light of something like this, and we see it all the time, you know, it, it things get heated, what do what can drivers do to prevent this? Well, knowing that road rage is typically an outward of expression of other anger or high stress, it's really important to look at areas of your life that might be stressful and think about what you can do to actually manage it. Right. You know, and consider your commute. Mm. So, you know, I know in the morning that my commute might be 15 minutes, but if yeah. there's an accident, it might be an hour. So I should probably just plan for an hour. Right, right. And if I give myself that leeway, I'm gonna feel less rushed and therefore yes. less angry. Okay. And the fact that wherever you're going, right, 90% of the time, it's not gonna be a life or death situation. Yes, right? keep if, it if in you're late for that client yes. meeting, people typically are pretty understanding because right. guess what? We all have to deal with valley traffic. Yeah, yeah. it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Good, good to keep it in perspective. All right, our last case here. 19 years ago, a newborn baby was found in a woman's trash can at Phoenix Sky Harbor. Now, the woman who's accused of the 2005 murder, Annie Anderson, has until April 15th to be extradited back to Arizona after she was arrested at her home in Arlington, Washington, back in December. According to Phoenix police, the baby, named Baby Skyler by authorities, died of suffocation. The full-term baby still had its umbilical cord attached. Anderson is now 51 years old and charged with suspicion of first-degree murder. Catherine, this has been 19 years. I vividly remember when this happened. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it like? Who would have thought that all these years later that there would have been an arrest? Right. I mean, I, I can't even imagine what it's like for her thinking for almost 20 years that I got away with it. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's... That's a lifetime for some right, people. Right, you right? think it's over. Right, for yeah. her, it's it's right. almost half of her life. Right, right. Um, which is, I mean, it's just amazing, I think, how technology has really improved mm -hmm. when it comes to investigating crimes. And that, I mean, what a, what a testament to Phoenix police who just did not give up on right. this and really worked closely with the FBI. Exactly. You know, here in Arizona, many of you may know that we do have a safe haven law that basically allows someone to legally and anonymously leave a baby at safe places Places like a hospital or a fire station. But if someone didn't know about this law, why would any mother abandon their child like this? I mean, the way that this happened, right, is just so heartbreaking. Yeah. But when you when you think about like what is gonna cause a mother to abandon her newborn child, there can be a number of things. It could be financial instability, right. you know, it could be lack of access to health care, you know, who knows? Because she was here visiting for um, a real estate. Mm -hmm. intensive kind of course and heading back home you know who knows maybe there was somebody back home who would not have been okay if she had an abortion and yeah. you know she could have the baby and then lie about right you know what had happened in such a public place though such that's that's why it's, it it stood out as just so jarring and shocking right out of all of the places yeah. Yeah. You know, and obviously she had been staying at a hotel, so maybe this felt like a very public place where there's so many people coming and going, right. and she thought cover her tracks, but yeah. oh, horrible. It is, it is. All right, Catherine, thank you so very much for all your analysis and insight into the four cases. We so appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to follow our YouTube channel for more content and watch the Ask the Experts segment weekdays at 4 p.m. and right here on our 12 Plus app.